missus or your girl might text you and it's like a long message, you just put okay at the end. First line's gonna tell you what the problem is and the bottom is a resolution usually. So just read the top, you didn't call me on Friday. The bottom part, make sure you call me. So everything in between is just pointless. People have been saying, how can they support the channel? Chisel, bye, chisel. I've got tops, got hoodies. I've got the Jungle Mall Z tees, like the Pain and Full Star tees. You lot can support, buy some of the merch. I'll be able to churn out more content. This one, I'm just waiting by myself for the, for the moment and I'll bring out more colors. Please support me. Sold out now on my YouTube channel, featuring Gable Siam. Stay locked, I'll be back soon. <laughs> one thing in business, yeah? I say is that you can't cut corners, you can't. And for the past three months, a lot of you know that I've actually closed Sign London. So um, I'm reopening back now on May the 27th. And the reason why I closed was that because of COVID, I had issues with my chef. So since December the 16th, 17th, my chef had had COVID, took the vaccine and wasn't feeling too well. So sometimes he'd be working, sometimes he wasn't. Then I'd have to get agency staff in. So I've had literally five or six chefs since January up until March. And one thing you learn for hospitality is that if you're a restaurant, everything is based primarily on food. And if the food is not good, my mum always says you're only as good as your last performance. So I had to make the decision of closing. So what we're gonna to do today is just literally discuss business. A lot of people wanna know the ins and outs of a restaurant, hospitality and how it works. And I'm gonna try and break it down to you guys as much as possible while actually making cocktails during this session. So um, first of all, it started in Birmingham when I actually first um, opened the restaurant. And I always say that when it comes to business, you know, your mixtape, okay, should be whatever it is at the beginning. So for me, events was my mixtape. And why I say a mixtape is this, when someone wants to bring out an album or something, what they usually do is test the waters. So I wrote a book um, in 2012 and I started blogging at first. And when I was blogging, I could see how many people were actually listening or should I say reading my blog, which made me think that there's enough people here, so surely I could write a book. So in regards to opening a restaurant, what I'd done is I started doing events first. And from doing events, I was getting people down to other people's restaurants and bars and filling it up. So I said to myself, if I can bring people to this person's restaurant or bar, why can't I do it myself? So what I did um, in that case is that I literally started in Birmingham because I didn't actually know um, that there, how much money it would take to actually open one in London. It was pretty expensive. And because I used to do events in Birmingham, I decided that that would be my starting point. So what I'm gonna do whilst I'm talking about this video, I'm gonna be making cocktails. So I'm gonna literally talk you through one of the cocktails we do called the Blu-ray, which is the most popular cocktail at Scion London. It actually um, consists of Ray and Nephew, Blue Curacao, coconut syrup, and then we have pineapple juice. So I'm literally gonna be making that whilst talking. So yeah, so what I did I, um, ideally is that I went to Birmingham and I started there first. A lot of times people ask, where did you get the money from? And one thing a lot of people don't really do is tell the truth about how they got the money or got the funds. Sometimes people act like people are not working hard enough. A lot of people work hard. And if working hard was the only route to success, those in Nigeria or my country would be rich by now because they work a lot of hours. They work their palms off. So I'm not going to pretend and sit there that I worked a nine to five and sort of did 40, 60, 70 hours a week and saved the money. No, I didn't. I took a loan from a family friend. So I had half the money myself. And I took just over 50 grand from a family friend. And I always make a point of thanking him because if I didn't get that 50K from him, I wouldn't have been able to open the restaurant which I opened in Birmingham in 2016. So um, one thing I will say is that that's where I got the money from and that's how it started. Now, the funniest thing is that um, one thing I didn't do pretty well is I didn't plan very well. And because I didn't plan very well, I ran out of money in Birmingham. So when opening Birmingham, I had to get loans from family and friends to actually do it because um, I went into Birmingham and without getting builders in there, I just started estimating how much it was going to cost myself like an idiot. So I'd gone into there and just thought, okay, flooring's only going to cost me two grand. That's only going to cost me five grand. Without knowing it, by around January, February, I started doing the refurb in November, December. Within two months, two and a half months, I ran out of money. Now, because I've got good credit with my friends and family, I was able to get money from them to continue doing the project. But if I didn't get money from them, that's how I would have closed down. Now, um, people often ask, how did you get people into the restaurant? You know, what made you think you could take the risk? I've always taken risks. And in business, it's all about risk. And if you're not willing to take the risk, stay in your day job. And I always hate this mantra, this rhetoric that people always say, oh, leave your day job. You, all you're doing is making your boss rich. I know plenty of people who are in day jobs making more money than me. Okay, obviously there are anomalies to everything, but I always say that if you're earning good money in your day job and you've got peace of mind and you're happy, stay in it. There's no point leaving. So um, yeah, so I'm still making this Blu-ray by the way. All right, so what we do first of all is um, we put some ice inside our cocktail. And I'll tell you the funniest thing about when we put ice in cocktails, people think we're trying to cheat them. Yeah, we are. We're not all generals, but we are. But the most important thing about the ice is thermodynamics. Now, if you want to heat a room really quick, are you going to put one heater in there or you're going to put four? You're going to put four heaters in the same way if you want to keep your drink cooler for longer you're going to put more ice and that's why one of the reasons why we put ice in your cocktail is to keep the, the cocktail cooler 
for longer as possible. So we fill it up with ice. And the funny thing is that when, we, when we're doing cocktails and doing things like this, people always say, ah, oh, take the ice out, take the ice out. Or somebody will look at this glass and think there's more cocktails or more juice in this glass than this glass. It's not true. These glasses contain the exact amount of fluid when making cocktails. So there is a spec to it. So when you do go to a restaurant or a bar and someone's making your cocktail, don't beat that cheeky food customer and start tipping the ice back in the ice hole. Some of you have done that here. And if not for the fact that I love Jesus and Mary Magdalene, I would have told you about your grandma. But you know, I'm a nice person, so I won't do that. So I'm going to prove to you and show you that whether you have this coupe glass, which usually has your porn star martini, or you have this glass, which has your Blu-ray rum punch, it's primarily the same thing. So I'm going to give you a little test so you can see that there isn't much difference between the two. All right, so here we go. As you can see. So whether you come to a cocktail bar and have this glass or have this glass, it's exactly the same thing as you can see. And also it is the exact same volume as this. So sometimes I've made someone a cocktail and they went, oh, I want it in a highball, give me it to my highball, I don't want the small one. It's the same thing as this and I'll show you again. There's no difference. It's exactly the same. So all three glasses, as you can see, whether you come to Scion or go to any restaurant or bar and take this one, this one or this one, there's a spec to your cocktail. So when people say, oh, can you not put that much ice in there? Sometimes people say it because they think they're going to get more alcohol. Mate, all you're going to do is get more juice and you're going to complain that your cocktail doesn't have enough alcohol and you can't taste the alcohol. And with cocktails, cocktails are meant to be balanced. So you shouldn't really be able to taste the alcohol. That's why when you come to Scion London, ask anyone that's come here. They always leave a very merry because they drink the cocktails and don't realise that, you know, we actually put alcohol in our cocktails. So we don't cheat you. So yeah, just getting straight to the point and straight to the facts in regards to that. So yeah, I'm going to finish off this Blu-ray for you. But yeah, so obviously I went to, I went to Birmingham, opened there, and people have asked how much it cost. Now, there are tricks to getting um, commercial properties, okay? Some will be a leasehold, some will be a freehold. So in Birmingham, okay, when I was buying the business, I always say to people that before you go and take any property on, always do a land registry search. It'll cost you about £1.50. That way you know who the landlord is for that property. Because a lot of times when people are selling, they're selling because they're in dire straits, meaning that they can't afford to pay their lease. So what the best thing to do is this. I always advise to go to the landlord, find who the landlord is, send them a letter. Or if you go on company's house, you'll be able to find out where he's actually situated, where he might have an office. Find out who he is, give him a call, or send him a letter and say, hi, I'm in talk to someone to try and take over your business or your building, blah, blah, blah. Now with Birmingham, I did a little cheeky thing in Birmingham. So there was a premium for the property in Birmingham. They wanted, I think it was 50 or 60 grand at the time. Now they was in debt to the landlord. So I found out who the landlord was and literally just called the landlord. I said, hello, mate, trying to take over your building. He goes, yeah, no problem. He goes, um, the people who are selling it are asking for this amount of premium. He goes, don't give it to them. I'm kicking them out shortly because I haven't paid anything. And he goes, I'm pretty sure if you give them that premium, they're not going to give it to me. So it's a win-win for you. So what I did now is um, I had to speak to the agent because obviously the agent, all right, is meant to get a commission from the sale. Now, if I go straight through the landlord, that means I skip out the agent, which doesn't get his commission. So what I had to do was give the agent a bit of money on the side, a little drink, okay, and that's how I got the property for free. I literally didn't pay that 60K and I got it for free. So if you're trying to find a property, one thing I would advise you guys to do is find out who the landlord is, literally send an email, okay, or send a letter or make a call and find out whether or not the people selling are in dire straits. Because if they need money, okay, and um, they're not going to give it to the landlord, the landlord will more than likely say to you, just hold tight, okay, don't pay the premium, I'm going to kick them out soon and the building's yours. So that's how I managed not to pay that 60 grand. All right, so fast forward now, restaurants opened in April. And one thing I will say is that when people say that black people don't support black businesses, they sure do. Because primarily... And let me skip back, actually. The funniest thing is that when I actually opened um, Scion, um, I looked at um, Ghost, who was in um, that film called Power. I thought I was going to be that fancy guy walking around in a long Mac jacket, walking around, just looking at the babes. How you doing, darling? You right, Daphne? I love the red wig babes. I thought that was going to be me. But when I actually opened the restaurant, it wasn't like that. So there was a Sunday, the second week I opened, my bartender rang me and said, Gabriel, because he was kind of, it was like, I think it was Polish or me, I can't remember. But Gabriel, I'm not good this morning. I said, oh, that's nice. What time are you coming in? He said, oh, I don't feel well. I said, it's only you working today, mate. What time are you coming in? He goes, you want me to die? I don't feel good. I'm not coming in. So I had to open the restaurant, okay? And I had no bartender. So obviously, on the sign it says, um, Scion Cocktail Bar and Dining. You know, sometimes the English can be cheeky. So obviously, one lady's come in now, and obviously she's, she wanted to have some cocktails. So she said to me, I said to her, unfortunately, we can't, um, no, she asked me for a mojito. And I said, unfortunately, we can't do a mojito today. She goes, um, why is that? I goes, oh, we're not doing cocktails. So what, do you know what she did? She picked up the menu, 
And she goes, hmm, Scion cocktail, cocktail bar and dining, cocktails. It says you sell cocktails here, why do you have any cocktails? So I said to her, oh, my bartender is ill. He couldn't come in today. She goes, oh, who, who's the owner here? I said, oh, um, I am. She goes, oh, so as the owner, you don't think that as a small business, you should have learned some of the ins and outs of your business, even something as simple as making cocktails. So I sat there that day and said, rah, I'm actually gonna have to work here, you know, cause if I, if I ain't got a bartender and I can't get agency staff to come in, who's gonna make the cocktails? So literally that week, I started learning how to make cocktails. And since then, as you can see, um, I've somehow managed to blag my way into making cocktails. So this is a Blu-ray, as you can see, it's um, nice and layered. That is, come on, that is a, you come, you come here for that, innit? That is, oh my dear, let me just even just put a little straw in there for ya. Oh my diddy, look at the layering! Don't piss me off, look at the layering. And the maddest, maddest thing is that when I opened the restaurant cocktail bar, it wasn't my intention to make cocktails, it wasn't at all. But unfortunately, that day when my bartender rang and said you couldn't make it, I was forced to make a cocktail. So that's our Blu-ray, all right? So yeah, so we opened now in April and um, obviously went really well. And I had a very unique business model. And that's one thing. And um, as I was talking about black people supporting support businesses, they do. They just don't support the bad ones. We've always supported black businesses. And I think, um, we were talking about nepotism the other day on the podcast. And I think it's important, whether you like it or not, each party tend to look after their own. I know it's going to sound a bit pessimistic or a bit bad, but it's the bottom line, whether you like it or not. People look after their own. And I think it's very important that we support the good ones. And um, we shouldn't make allowances for black businesses or any businesses. If a business is not good, don't patronise it. Whether it's black, blue, avatar, orange or whatever, or pink panther. If the business is not, not good, you don't go. Now, I'll tell you what's really interesting and funny is this. When I first opened a business in Birmingham, okay, it was um, primarily 50% um, white. 50% other. And as the blacks start coming, the whites started leaving. And it's one thing that's happened in most businesses that I talk to people which are black. And it's one of those things where I say to myself, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Now, it's, I don't know how to word this because sometimes I've gone out for a drink and if I walk past maybe a pub or walk past a bar and it's maybe primarily full of white people, sometimes I might feel a bit apprehensive. And I think we all do it. Like, you know, sometimes you go somewhere like, ooh, not many of us in there. And there's one thing that we do have is called, it's, it sounds bad, but we do do it, you know? And, and I, I get why sometimes when you might open a place. So I'm in my restaurant in Dulwich. So when I first opened, I would say it's about 40% white, 60% others. And I remember as the more blacks started coming here, the whites started leaving. So I remember one time a mom white lady came to the door, you know, she's like, oh, hi, good evening. This is a really nice place. How did you get it? I was like, huh? I said, repeat that again, Daphne. She goes, oh, how did you get it? I said, the same way anyone else gets a shot. What do you mean by that? Oh, no, no, no. I wasn't being funny. I just, I just wanted to say, I just wondered how you got it. I said, the same way anyone else does. So then she said to me, oh, um, just a quick question. Um, when are you guys open to the public? I said, what do you mean when we open to the public? She goes, no, no, I'm just wondering, like, when, it always seems like there's a private function going on. I said, what do you mean? Now, I knew what she meant, okay? Because I then asked her what she meant. She basically meant that the place is full of black people. So she wanted to know when it was actually open to the public. And um, I find it interesting because I, I own the bit of land which is across the road and I rented it out to someone to do like paninis, um, like a vegan kind of juicy kind of whatever thing. So she does her thing over there. Now, this is literally opposite my shop. That place is full of white people. They have their paninis, their coffees, their lattes, their flipper frappuccino. What's that frappuccino you fake middle-class people drink with those little creamy things on top. That frappu, I can't even pronounce, I'm not Italian, but yeah, bellissimo bonjour, pour le vous français, mademoiselle, comme tu comme ça. So that place there is full of them. They go there and eat in, in the cold, they drink in the cold, it's an outdoor place, but she's done it really well. And that place is directly opposite my restaurant. So you've got to say to yourself, there's no way that you've seen that place and I've not seen these places, but they don't come in here. I've done the place nice, nice enough for them to come in. I even played the game. When I first opened, the, the floor was typically European. So it's not that I say you would walk in and think, oh, okay, maybe it's not for us. And then you got to ask yourself, what does that mean that it's not for us? What does that mean? But yeah, when you first, when you first open, and I would say to people that the biggest mistake I made, and, I've, and I'll call it a mistake, is this. Um, I'm opening other businesses very soon, and I'm going to make sure I'm not the face of the business. And why I say that is this. For marketing purposes, it's good to be the face of the business because if you use social media, you can get a lot of your following in. But if your network is primarily black and you're black, whether you like it or not, the rest of the 97% are not going to come. 
As black people in the UK, we make up 3%. In London, it's roughly between 10 and 11%. So it makes us think that we're surrounded by black people, but it's not the case. If you live in pockets where there's black people, you might think that, but in reality, it's not the case. Now, some people might shoot me down for this, but you've got to ask yourself one important question. If I told you that you could open a business and primarily your target audience is only going to be 3%, would you go into it? If I said to you there's a business you can open that maybe you could have 100%, which would you pick? And unfortunately, if you're going to make yourself the face of the business, you may struggle to get the remaining 97%, bearing in mind you're part of the 3%. So you've got to think very mindful of whether you want the 3% or you want the remaining 97%. And don't get me wrong, it's good to have black businesses, it's good. But you have to think about how long can it sustain with just a 3%. Remember, your business as a restaurant, primarily on a Wednesday and Thursday or during the week, it heavily boils down to your locals as in the people who can walk here within maybe two or three minutes, or those who can drive here within five minutes. Now I'm in Dulwich, which is typically a middle-aged area, middle class. They've got this affluent people with money. So in this little, maybe, I don't know, 0.5 mile radius, they tend not to come in. So which means I'm getting business from everywhere else. And for you to travel sometimes, you have to bear in mind that it's usually gonna be a celebration. So in London, people come all the way from Enfield, Tottenham, Barking, Walthamstow. People travel from far to come here and it's appreciated. And that's one of the reasons why I had to close for two months to make sure I got everything back to how it was meant to be. Because whether I like it or not, a lot of people have seen Silent as a benchmark. And for one minute, I don't ever say that this thing is rocket science. But there are tricks to the trade, but it's not rocket science. And I always say representation is key. And so many people have opened restaurants off the back of me. And I'd rather more open and more businesses open because people need to see that there are other avenues and other outlets. And I also always say is that I am no smarter than anyone else. Okay, so this is our Blu-ray. Now there's one cocktail which people always love. I'm not gonna make it today, but it's called a rum punch. And the word rum punch comes from the Sanskrit word, which means five, which means it must have five ingredients, which is alcohol, sugar, juice, water, and spice. Alcohol, sh alcohol, sugar, juice, water, and spice. So the juice could be lemon and lime, um, the sugar could be a syrup, and the spice could be Angostura's bitters. So that's what's typically meant to be in a cocktail. So I'm not gonna make a rum punch because that's just typical. I'm now gonna go to a cocktail which is called a porn star martini. And it was made, funny enough, by a Ghanaian guy called Douglas Ankara. Rest in peace to Douglas Ankara who passed away um, just over a year ago. Um, he's the person that actually made the porn star martini. And when I found that it was um, a black guy, I was very shocked and surprised. And some of you might sit there and think, why are you surprised? I just didn't think that any Ghanaian had it in them to make cocktails, I'm sorry. I just didn't, you know, you don't try to claim jollof. I didn't think you lot had it in you. So when I heard it was a Ghanaian, I was, I was shocked. I didn't want to believe it, that a Ghanaian person could actually think and invent something. As you know, Nigeria is the Las Vegas of West Africa. We are the, we are the peoples. So when a Ghanaian is, is known to be inventing something, it's a shock to the system. I almost fell down and banged my head. So we're going to make a Ponsa Martini. Now, there are a lot of variations to how a porn star martini is made, um, but this is how I believe um, George, um, so Douglas Ankara um, had made it, or the spec he used. So what we're going to primarily start off with is it's got vanilla vodka, okay? It then has um, Pessoa, uh, passion fruit um, puree, and then it has vanilla syrup. That's what goes into a porn star martini, and then it has a shot of Prosecco on the side. So that's what goes into a porn star martini. So... Um, where was we now? So yeah, so when it comes to businesses, you have to be very mindful and if you want to be the face of it, because if you are going to be the face of it, you may end up losing the 97% that would come to your business. So the next things I'm opening now, I'm not going to be the face of them. I'm just going to use organic PR and marketing so that the, everybody can go to it. Because a lot of these restaurants that are open, you don't know who the owners are. They just open it and people go there. And that's what I'm going to do because I'm tired of, and also being the face of it, it's hard to separate yourself emotionally from the business. So when someone comes to the business, doesn't enjoy it, even though it is Scion London, because I'm heavily involved in it, it's seen as Gabriel's restaurant. Oh, I went to Gabriel's place. I see that guy on Insta, Gabriel Scion. I went to his restaurant. So if it's a good thing, you take it. And if it's a bad thing, you take it. And that's one thing about being out there. If you're going to take the, the praise, you've got to take the criticism. And if you ain't got thick skin, don't waste your time. When it comes to anything putting yourself out there, don't waste your time. That's why I say stay in your day job. It's the best thing ever. Stay in your day job. And people say, but oh, you got a restaurant. If I could pull myself back, I probably wouldn't do it. And you're like, what do you mean? I wouldn't do it. There's too, many, there's too many variables when it comes to a restaurant. So when you get to the door, if you feel you weren't greeted properly, you could get vexed. I might sit you next to the table where it's loud. So you might have come on a date, or you might be with your mum, or say you're a group of 50-year-olds who just want a quiet night out. I might have sat you next to a birthday table of maybe 25-year-olds who are making noise. There's so much sciences behind restaurants. So even when I'm looking at the bookings, I'm clocking to see the ages and see who's booked. Because if I know that I've got um, maybe an age group of maybe 
a table of two who's 50, I look at the name. You know those old names like Dorothy and Agnes? So if I look in the booking system and I see a Dorothy and Agnes, I'm like, hmm, these don't seem old. So I might put them into the, let me not say old, sorry, matured. I might put Dorothy and Agnes in this corner over here and I'll put the, the, the 25 year olds who are having a birthday over there so that when they're making noise over there, they can't hear them there. But look at the mistake I might have made now. The speakers are right underneath there. So now I've got to say to myself, hmm, the music's going to be a bit loud. I can't put Dorothy and Agnes under the speakers. So maybe I've got to move them over there. So there's so much different things that go into it. Now I've seated you down now. I might have sat you underneath the aircon. You might say to me, oh, hi, it's a bit cold over here, but it's actually hot outside. So someone's got to sit under there, but now I've seated you there it's upset your evening. I might have sat you next to, I don't know, that table by the mirror. You might say, oh, it's too close to the toilet. The toilets never smell like Scion, but you're gonna complain your next. There's too many things involved and it's, it's constant customer service. Even when it's time to get you up from the table. Tables are two hours here. Even when you book, it says two hours. By, if you book the table, I'll give, you, I'll give you a mad story. That table right behind there, customer came in, they booked the table from five to seven. They were 30 minutes late. I said, no problem. We'll still seat you. I need your money. So you sat them down now. So obviously um, they had a table from five to seven. So at 6.50, was it 6.55? One, was it either 6.50 or 6.55? Um, I brought them the bill. Hey, the lady to me. Um, hi, we've got, yes, yes, that was it. It was 10 minutes left. She goes, hi, we've got 10 minutes left to our table. Why have we brought the bill? So I said to them, um, at, at what point would you say I should bring the bill? Hera, that's for you to figure out. God is testing me today. You know, like, have you ever watched a film where they kind of like, where something happens, it doesn't really happen? So where like, for instance, so, um, say someone's angry and they get like a hammer and knife and start stabbing and hitting somebody. And all of a sudden they wake up and it was a dream. In my dream, I lifted that table. I just, get, I lifted the whole table up. But you know, because of TripAdvisor and Trustpilot and, you know, Google, you have to be nice. So she said to me, that's for you to figure out. So that day I walked out. I just walked out on the road. I just, just walked. I just took some fresh air. I just took some fresh air because you can't, you can't, you, when them things happen, what do you do? And that's part of, it's constant, constant customer service. And because of reviews now, you've got to try your best to be as nice to customers as possible. When it wasn't Google and TripAdvisor, you just dash drink on someone by accident and just say, oh, sorry about that. The drinks are spilt on them. But with customers like that, what do you do? It's constant customer service. But yeah, we're going to go to our Pawn Star Martini, which is made with vanilla vodka. Um, we use Pessoa, which is a passion fruit liqueur. Okay, let me just get my vodka. Where are we? All right, got my vodka. Okay, and now we're gonna do our vanilla syrup. And then we've got our um, passion fruit puree. So what we do with our porn star martini, um, once again, um, I'm gonna talk you through the apparatus, apparatus that we use. I should have told you from the beginning. This is called a muddler. It's what we usually use to like, when we're making mojitos to muddle our um, fruits, etc. This is a Boston shaker, which we use, we put in our tin to shake our cocktails. And as you can imagine, if it's a Boston shaker, it came from a state in America called Boston. This is called a jigger. It's what we use to measure our weights when it comes to spirits. If you go to a bar and you ask for a single, it should come on this side, a double being 50 mil, should come inside here. And this is our champagne saucer. No, not champagne saucer. What's this called again? A coupe, sorry, a coupe glass. So yeah, so I'm gonna literally make our porn star martini for you. So typically how we do it here is we use 40 vanilla vodka. Okay. We then use 30 of our Pessoa. All right, we then use 25. No, we, let's say 30, 30 of our passion fruit puree. And then we then put 20 of our vanilla syrup. Now, some people actually add lemon juice into it to balance it out. Now, I'm on the fence of it. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, but on this occasion, I'm not, because I don't like to put that in there, because the passion fruit is pretty bitter as it is anyway. So what we're gonna do now is, Shake our cocktail. And the reason why we shake our cocktails, does anyone know? It's to balance out our ingredients and to dilute at the same time as to mix them all together. And that's why we put, and also obviously the ice in there being shook is gonna make our cocktail colder. So typically with our Pont Star Martini, you should double strain or fine strain it. So that's what we're gonna do with this. Let me find my strainer. All right. And don't forget, we're still gonna put our Prosecco. Um. 
Okay, then we're gonna place our passion fruit. Uh, where's our passion fruit on? Okay, on the top. And last but not least, we're gonna get our shot of Prosecco. Uh, where's my Prosecco? Now, the typical way to hold a champagne bottle or Prosecco bottle is to literally put your thumb in the dimple and pour like so. And there's our porn star martini made by Douglas Ankara. Once again, rest in peace to Douglas Ankara. So that's our porn star martini, which is going to go over here. So yeah, so with the restaurant game, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise anyone who hasn't got thick skin to get involved because you're going to end up pe telling people to go and meet their mums with a straw. So you're not going to want to do that. So I'd say if you're not really tough skinned, stay away from it. And also with business, as I always mention, it's important to know the nicks and crooks. So when, when I opened Birmingham, I wasn't aware of what business rates were. Like literally, I just had money and opened a restaurant. That's why I say it's not rocket science. I'm not any smarter than you. I just thought to myself that if I'm bringing people to someone else's event, that I could do it. And that's exactly what happened. So I would always say to you, it's very, very important to do your research. Business rates, very important. Um, you can research them on the Gov website to see exactly how much you have to pay. When I opened Birmingham, I didn't even know what business rates was. So literally, I got a letter through the post to pay some business rates from the council. I just thought it's like something you can just ignore. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, like your missus or your girl might text you and it's like a long message and you just put okay at the end. You know, you just skim read. So I just skim read it. Especially, you know, when you get that message from the girl, you just read the first line, you read the bottom line. Because, you know, the first line's going to tell you what the problem is and the bottom is a resolution usually. So just read the top. You didn't call me on Friday. The bottom part. Make sure you call me. So everything in between is just pointless, isn't it? So I read the business rates thing. I saw the first, but I saw the bottom. I thought, ah, let me ignore that. So two, three months later, I remember, I opened in, in what? April. So, and I took the building over November 2015. So by December, that had been technically a whole year I'd not paid business rates. So one day now, I've gone to the restaurant, innit? To basically um, open. So uh, first of all, I saw a letter through the post. No, it was a letter through the post at first, and I ignored it. So then um, I got a call from the bailiffs. Hello, Mr. A.O. Joe, how you doing, mate? I was like, who's this? Still the so-and-so and so enforcement agent. I said, what are you doing around here? Because yeah, mate, you owe, you owe some your account or some money. I said, ah, oh, you're kidding, mate. What for? For your business rates. I said, I hung up on them. They called me back. Listen, mate, we're outside your shop now. We know what time you open. You're going to come here at some point, mate. It's not a house. This is a shop. We can see your opening hours. You open on Wednesday. For I said, Jesus. So I thought maybe they were just pulling my bluff. So I pulled up now to the restaurant. I can see the white van there. I said, ah, Jesus. I got to the door. So as I got to the door, two of them henchmen jumped up. Hello, mate. Told you we'll catch ya. I said, what's up? He goes, yeah. Um, so either you pay the £9,000 now or we start collecting goods. I said, what? He goes, mate, listen, you've got customers coming in one hour. What do you want? Do you ever want to pay the money? I goes, oh, can I pay in bits and pieces? He goes, no, mate, it's gone past that point. It's either we take the £9,000 now or you won't be shaking any cocktails. I said, Jesus Christ. And that was in December. That's how I had to pay them £9,000 in one go. So check up on your business rates. Very, very important. So yeah, we've got our porn star martini, we've got our Blu-ray, and once again, the only reason why I learned how to make cocktails, once again, is because when you're opening the business, as much as possible, it's important for you to know everything. When it comes to Sign London, I take orders, I clean, I do the toilets, I take out food, I can lay the tables, I can make the cocktails. So there are times when, for instance, um, yesterday being Sunday the, what was yesterday's date? Yesterday would have been Sunday the 22nd. One of my bar staff has got um, a hip problem. So it was, was really busy on that Sunday and I was meant, he was meant to come in, but he didn't come in. So I had, to, I had to step in yesterday and work behind the bar as well as DJing. So there's so many different things I do in here to make the business work. And it's important that you're hands-on because if you're not hands-on, it may suffer unless you've got a lot of money to pay a very good manager. But it's hard to find somebody who will run your business as well as you do. And that's a problem I'm having right now is um, knowing how to delegate, which means finding someone that can, you can say, do this and they can do it well. And that's the biggest problem is that finding someone that can do it well. So um, where are we now? We've got our porn star martini. We've got our Blu-ray. And the last cocktail I'm going to make is going to be called a Bellini. Um, a Bellini was invented by someone called Giuseppe Capriani. Was it Giovanni Capriani? Don't quote me. But in an area called Venice in around, I think it was the 1940s. And how a Bellini is typically made, it's we use a champagne flute. Okay, and what's meant to have in there? It's meant to have some form of a puree which is either maybe strawberry puree, passion fruit puree, and typically it's meant to be made with champagne. But because restaurants and bars are cheapskates, we use Prosecco, because Prosecco is obviously a lot cheaper than, um, what do you call it, than champagne. 
So what we're going to do today is we're going to make um, a bellini. We're going to make a strawberry bellini. And that bellini is typically made with layering. So this is another skill I'm going to teach you in regards to making cocktails. It's called layering. So let me just get myself... Uh, but um, a customer came to the restaurant and they bought a bottle of bourbon. I'm just going to say they forgot to take it with them. So we've got um, champagne we can actually use today. So we're going to do it the proper way. So um, whoever you are, thank you for the, the bottle of verb which you didn't, didn't take with you. Thank you. God will bless you abundantly. So um, yes, we're going to make our Bellini. Typically, um, I'm going to use strawberry puree. So I like to put 25% strawberry puree. And the next part of it is to actually try and layer and separate the puree from the champagne. So once again, you put your thumb at the dimple and the key is to place the base of your cocktail spoon just on top of the puree, okay? So now try and get the rim of your champagne bottle as close to the top of the glass so you don't get splashed back. And there is a, a skill to it. So as you're pouring, steady hand, you're gonna be raising your spoon slowly but surely as you're pouring. And if you've got a steady hand, it should layer. There you go, looks like I've done it before. Fantastic. That is our strawberry Bellini. And typically what I would do with that is I would get a strawberry and literally place it inside of it. So let me get grab my strawberry. And do we have strawberries left or have we we ran out because we don't open on Monday or Tuesday so I don't think I actually have any strawberries in here but typically would throw a strawberry in there so what we've got here is we've got our porn star martini we've got our blu-ray which we do at Sign London it's one of our signature cocktails which we only make here and this is our strawberry bellini so we've just done three cocktails here for you we also do cocktail master classes and I do them outside of Sign London so that's another way I diversified in regards to trying to make some extra money anything you're doing in business you've got to try and find as many avenues to make money in the business so with Sign London um, one of the avenues that we make money from Sign London is obviously as a restaurant um, second part of it is we do private hire so for instance you can come to Sign London have a meal from say eight o'clock till half ten which is when we close at half ten then you can book the place from eleven till two and have your own party. So I charge a higher fee to have it from 11 till two. So that's another way where the business makes money. And then you've got a mobile cocktail bar. So for instance, say the restaurant is going on, I can go somewhere else and make money from making cocktails. So when any business you've got, there are different ways to diversify and make money. So yeah, when it comes to, to business, I say, you're only as good as your last performance. Um, stay in your day job if you, if you want to. I don't know why we have this rhetoric or these people always talk about stop, stop making your boss money. This whole thing is not easy. And I'll tell you that for free. Um, the stress that I was under for the past three months because things were going wrong, it weren't easy. Remember, I closed for two months. I had staff I still had to pay full time. And the thing about it is that if I didn't pay them full time, they've got bills to pay. Um, they've got family to feed. And I could have sat there and said, you know what? Tell them they ain't going to get paid and maybe try and recruit new staff. But what you don't realise is that with Brexit, what's happened now is that a lot of the foreign nationals that worked here, they've all gone back because they couldn't, they couldn't get working visas. And that's one thing you haven't realized is that you go to all these cocktail bars and restaurants, typically you're getting served by Fernando or Augustus. Fernando's gone, there's no Fernando no more, unless you're gonna go and take me out. There's no Fernando, they've all gone. And I'm being dead serious, the workforce for hospitality has disintegrated. You go and ask anyone in hospitality right now, looking for staff, there's no staff anywhere. And that's another big problem you got, you're gonna realize now is that because everything has gone up in regards to products that you buy, alcohol, even staff wages have gone up. Because what you didn't realize was that, it's gonna sound really bad, but when people are coming from disadvantaged countries, they're happy to come to England and work for anything because they're just happy to have a job. And what I found with that is that where, where you could pay someone 11 pounds before to go and make cocktails, 11 pound an hour, you haven't to now pay 15, 16 pound an hour because the English will not work for 11 pounds. And everything's about what you're worth. And I always say that when people complain about the jobs they're in, I say, look at your skill set. And that's why I always implore people to go and study courses, because I always say you're only one course away from changing your pay packet. So um, yeah, the working force hospitality is literally disintegrated. So that's one thing I found really hard is recruiting staff. So even though I closed for two months, it was one of those things where I had to do it, but I still had to pay my staff because they've got bills to pay. 